Hey, thanks for being here today as we are in week number six of our Deuteronomy series, this new people of God. Thanks for being right here. Thanks for all of you who are watching online, and a shout out to all the folks who are over in the Life Center. Glad that you guys are with us as well. We all know that we've got a lot of problems in our nation. We all know that there's a lot of things that aren't working out nearly as well as they should be. And one of the most um, complicated and contentious problems that we have today revolves around our theme for this morning, and that is this thing called justice. We're going to take kind of a deep look at this issue of justice because it is amazing what God has to say about that theme in the book of Deuteronomy and throughout the Bible. In 2008, uh, an author named Shane Claiborne wrote a book called Jesus for President, a very, very interesting book. Now, Shane at that time was really hot on the, on the speaking circuit. He was like this prophetic presence in the world of evangelicalism, and everybody wanted him to speak at all their conferences. He was at one conference, a big one, and he was one of the keynote speakers. And when he got up to, to have his turn to speak, uh, he wound up saying to the, to, the, uh, to the assemble group, so tonight you're going to hear the best sermon ever preached. Now, you know, some people say, well, that's a little bit audacious of Shane to say that about what he's going to say, but hey, let's give him a hearing. And what he did is he opened the Bible and read for the rest of the evening the Sermon on the Mount. When he was done, he closed up the Bible and said, it still applies today. Let's get out there and do it. And the audience was like kind of like dis disappointed because they had come to hear Shane and not just the words of the Sermon on the Mount. Today, about our theme, I had sort of thought about, well, maybe that's just what I ought to do. Maybe I ought to just find 111 verses in the Bible. By the way, that's how many are in the Sermon on the Mount and spend my next 30 minutes just reading the Bible to you about this thing called justice. Well, I decided not to do that, and instead I narrowed it down to about 25 verses, and we're reading a lot of things, but we're having a little bit of commentary on, on that. And by the way, all of these verses are on the blog for today. You go to our website, you click the blog, the verses are there, the points are there, there's a couple of images that we we'll use, they're all right there, so that way you don't have to worry about missing something. Just would like you to kind of focus with me today on what God has to say. And I do want to let you know that my starting point on every single theme, every issue, every problem is the Bible. I'm always going to ask first and above all, what has God had to say to us about this particular theme? And then only after I've come to understand some of that, will I then go and see what are some other sources having to say? I, my starting point is always the Bible. And so therefore, my first question I ask is, well, what does the Bible say about justice? And that's actually, uh, it's going to take some time because there's like a thousand verses in the Bible on this topic. My second question is, well, do I understand what the Bible is saying? It's one thing to read the words. It's another thing to understand them. And because there are so many, it takes a little bit of work to understand uh, what God is saying. I'm going to try and give you a couple of the main things that I believe God is saying. But then the third question may be even more important, and that is, now that I know and understand what God is saying, how do I live my life accordingly? How do I make a, an adjustments? How do I align my, my life with what God is saying? You know, it was Jesus who said, it's the wise person who not only hears his words, but puts them into practice. And it was James who said, we're to be doers of the word, not just people who hear. Now, my main goal today is for you to just grab hold of a few of the most important things God says that will help you and I then begin to reorder how we approach these particular complicated and contentious issues. And I do want to let you know that in Deuteronomy, God is doing like everything else in Deuteronomy. We've been telling you this week after week. It's brand new. Like what God is doing simply did not exist in the world prior to that time. And you know, we make the mistake that we're thinking, well, justice has always been around. People have always been interested in justice. And no, they haven't. And no, it hasn't. And you go to the ancient world and justice was like non-existent or barely existent. You even go to the great civilization sometime later, that of, that of Greece and Rome, and we think, oh, well, justice was surely there. And the answer is, well, no, it wasn't. They were, they were societies built on these hierarchies of power, control, domination, abuse, and justice was not necessarily a strong suit for those cultures. They lived by the other golden rule. Do you know what the other golden rule is? Okay, we know what our golden rule is, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But the other golden rule says, the one who has the gold makes the rules. Okay, the one who has the power makes the rules. 
The one who has gold and power are the ones who define what, how things are going to be and how they define things are always favorable for the person who has the gold and the power. God comes along and he's doing something radically different. It is beautifully, beautifully different. There are going to be four different things I want to unpack today and about this thing called justice. And, and, and maybe one little thing just before we get started is remember that this is not in the Bible. It is not a political word. It is a moral word, an ethical word, a spiritual word, justice that then needs to be applied to the world of politics, applied to the world of economics, applied to the world of justice, of of law, applied everywhere. But it is fundamentally a moral, ethical, spiritual ideal that God is imprinting upon his people that it is lived out everywhere. So in Deuteronomy chapter 16, we read a really striking one. Follow justice and justice alone so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. By the way, that's one of the the unusual occurrences when a word that is normally translated as right or righteous is translated as justice. Okay, here's the next one from from the Psalms. And see that all three of these words are appearing. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. It's a, a word of praise to God. Love and faithfulness go before you. Here's one from the prophet Amos. Let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Boy, that, that was a verse that some people say, well, didn't, didn't Martin Luther King Jr. say that? Well, yes, he did. He borrowed it from the prophet. Justice and righteous just rolling and splashing through our, our world. And then here's one that we use quite often at Living Word. It's from Micah chapter 6. Uh, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require. Let me just stop there for a moment. This is very significant. God is about to tell us what's good. And God requires us to be involved in these things that are good. There are three things that God says. Number one, act justly. Number two, love mercy. And let me just make a quick other little note here. It actually should be translated love, loving kindness. There's about nine different Hebrew words that can be translated as love. So love is one of those other words, uh, one of those other Hebrew words, but like love has said, love, loving kindness. It's almost a little bit redundant. And then walk humbly with your God. Okay, here's the last one just to get us started. This is from the prophet Isaiah, and it is looking far into the future about one who is coming our way. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight you. Know who he's talking about? I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on earth. Three times the prophet Isaiah is emphasizing the the mission of the Messiah is to bring justice to the world. I mean, this stuff is really, really important. Uh, It's been out for quite some time, but the Lion King, you remember the Lion King? You remember Scar, the jealous, petty, you know, younger brother, and now there's been a prince born Simba, and so Scar's never going to become king. And so there he is moping about in his cave. And you remember those words he said, Life's not fair. Life's not fair. By the way, I imagine that little mouse he is dingling and about to eat. It's like, Tell me about it, Scar. I know it's not fair. I'm about to be eaten. Life's not fair. By the way, for those of you who have kids, have you ever heard those words? Well, that's not fair. If Billy did this, I can't, it's not fair. You got a bigger business, not fair. I mean, kids are all time. Like, they intuitively want fairness. Now, as we get a little bit older as adults, we, we, maybe we don't use the word fairness quite as much, and we start to talk about, well, things are right or they're not right. Well, that's not right. It shouldn't be that way. And every now and then, we use the word justice. Man, hey, justice got served. That's good. Or, wow, what a miscarriage of justice. By the way, isn't that a striking word to, to link when, when justice, a miscarriage of justice? It was never even born. Or what a travesty of justice. I mean, this stuff is important to us. Fairness, rightness, uh, justice. Now, I, I have to admit that I, I've been very, very, it's very rare when I have been treated unfairly. It's very, very rare. I actually sat down this past week and I did like a little walk back through my history. And now, okay, I've been, I've been judged and misjudged. I've been criticized. And yeah, I mean, that just goes with the territory of, of being a leader. I mean, you're never a leader anywhere of anything without getting some kind of critique and criticism. And there's times when I think I've been criticized unfairly. But treated unfairly? 
I mean, I was racking my brain to try, when was I treated unfairly? Well, I actually remember the time. Uh, it was a couple years ago, and it was, for me, a fairly serious mistreatment. And boy, I was annoyed. And I was irritated. And I started brooding. And I got to a dark place about one episode of being mistreated unfairly, just one. And I started thinking, what do people do who they're treated unfairly time after time after time? Now, I eventually said, Brian, you got to get over this. And I, I prayed and worked it through and I got over it. But, but I mean, I understand, like, if, if you're on the receiving end of unfairness, it hurts. There's a lot of pain. And to be honest, I could not think of a time when I was the victim of injustice. I just could not think of a time. In fact, I thought of the exact opposite. I had been very, very blessed. I have lots of opportunities. I've had lots of advantages. I've had lots of resources that were thrown my way. I, yeah, not, I didn't, didn't deserve them. I was, just, I was at the right place at the right time, and so much good stuff came my way. So he, here's something that's very important. You know, your personal story, your personal location in our society, that is going to shape incredibly your experience of life as fair and just or unfair and not just. And right now, we are living in a time where people are inhabiting very different stories because there are very, very different locations. And there is a lot of pain that a lot of people have. And when pain is not resolved in the right way, it leads to anger. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. God's plan for justice is so beautiful. Four things. Now, by the way, there's probably about a dozen main points about from these thousand verses, but I'm, I'm going to give you four of the most important. And the first thing I just want to say is that God is a just God. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, for I, the Lord, I love justice. Can you just imagine God, I, mean, I just love justice. Do you, do you love justice the way I love justice? Beautiful. If you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, um, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Just and upright is he. Beautiful language describing the very essence of our God. And, and then in Deuteronomy, multiple times, but here's, here's one in particular is in, is in chapter 10, where we see this just God in action. So, so what, what does a God do who loves justice? Well, this is what he does. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. He shows no partiality. He accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the foreigner that's residing among you, and he gives them clothes and food and what they wind up needing. Oh, and by the way, you're to love those who are foreigners as well, because that's what you once were. In Deuteronomy, God is massively defining and advancing something he started back in Genesis with Abraham. Now, at Living Word for a long, long time, we have talked about, uh, about God's promise to Abraham. Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Not just for you, I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing to the nations. Abraham, I've got a plan. I love the world. I want the world to flourish. And I'm going to do it through you and through your kids. And their kids are going to grow and they're going to become tribes and they're going to become a people. And Abraham, it's through you. And we love the language of blessed to be a blessing. In fact, that's one of the things we have realized at Living Word. We have been so generously blessed by God that we are here to bless as much as we can. But in chapter 18, there's a very important dynamic that is added to what this blessing is all about. Verses 18 and 19, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and household after him. By the way, that's referring to all of the people of God coming. Okay, he's going to direct all his descendants to keep the way of the Lord. What's the way of the Lord doing what is right and just? So that God will bring about for Abraham everything that's promised. Abraham, you're going to have to be just. You're going to have to be righteous. And as, as you're passing those things on to your kids and to their kids, eventually to all of my people, as we become a people of justice and righteousness, we're going to be able to bless the world. But without it, there's going to be no flourishing. Where there's no justice, there's no flourishing. Where there's no righteousness, there's no flourishing. There is only pain. All right, point number two. Now, I just want to kind of play around with these words for a moment, and I hope you're okay with this. 
there's, a, there's a, an amazing synergy that comes about when these words get kind of you know, morphed together. You, you know what synergy is? It's when you take at least two things, and sometimes more, and you put them together, and the combination is better than what they were apart. Like chocolate. It's very good by itself. And peanut butter is very good by itself. And you pull them together, and you have this wonderful thing called a peanut butter cup that is simply amazing. But let's look at these words now. There's this amazing synergy with this thing called justice and righteousness and also loving kindness. Here are the three words. The first word is mishpat. And it's used about 120, 130 times in the Old Testament. It basically is almost always translated just or justice. Sometimes it is translated judge or uh, judgment. And, but it always has a sense of pronouncing, pronouncing the, the, right, the right verdict. The, the wrong are pronounced to be wrong and the innocent are vindicated. So that's the very essence of just and justice. The wrong are acknowledged to be wrong and the right are acknowledged to be right and justice is done. The second word is sedek and it occurs about 500 times. It's a little bit of a bigger word. Sometimes it's translated right. We could translate it rightness, but that sounds odd. And so we usually translate it righteous, sometimes righteousness. But here's all the word means. I mean, it's very, very simple. If something is right, it is lined up with a norm or a standard. Okay, let's go a little deeper. If something is right, it is fully what it is meant to be. And in the Hebrew word, it is a very relational word. Someone is right when they are fully who they should be in relationship to another person. So therefore, in the New Testament, it says there is no one that is righteous. By the way, it's in the Old Testament as well. There is no one righteous. It's talking about our, our connection with God. And those, nobody is fully who they should be when it comes to their relationship with God. There's something that's gone wrong. And, and so what God wants to do is God wants to make things right. He wants to make you righteous, fully in alignment with who you should be in this thing called relationship with God and relationship with others. So uh, Mishpat and now, now Sedek. And we move to the third term, and that is the word hesed. Now, hesed is maybe even more interesting because, well, sometimes it could mean love, and sometimes it could mean kindness. And when one of the very early translators of the Hebrew into the English, his name was Miles Coverdale, 1535, he's looking at this word and says, man, it's, hesed is bigger than love and it's bigger than kindness, but he actually made, he invented for the first time a new word, loving kindness. It did not exist in the English language until Miles Coverdale said, I need a better word than what we've currently got. And so when you read loving kindness in the Bible, it's almost always like this thing called hesed, hesed. Um, it's just amazing. And, and these words, they occur together over and over throughout the Bible. I'm just going to give you one, 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 uh, just one of them. He was one a little bit earlier. But this, this was one of the first passages I memorized, I mean, 40 years ago. From Jeremiah chapter 9, this is what the Lord says. Now, let, that, let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. In other words, man, if you're going to lay a claim to something about yourself, if there's something you want other people to know about yourself, that's not what they need to know about you. But here's what you all let them know about you, that you have understanding to know me. And what do you know about me? That I am the Lord who exercises. Here they are. Hesed, Mishpat, and Sedek on the earth. Loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. Because that's the stuff I delight in. That's who I am. That's my mission on earth. And so, wow, if you're going to just let people know something important about yourself, just tell them, hey, I, I know God. And this God is full of loving kindness and justice and righteousness. What an amazing God. So here's what's going on with these words. You know, it's like we look at them as separate but actually they're fused together. You know, you know, righteousness and justice are fused together. And then under, underlying them is this amazing thing called loving kindness. But really it's not even underlying them. It's like loving kindness gets infused into everything. So, so here's, here's one of these brand new things God is doing. It is brand new. He is literally coming up with a brand new configuration of justice. Uh, one author, Tim Keller, just nails it with his book called Generous Justice. That's it. Another author says, God is compassionately righteous. That's it. 
There, there is this compassionate justice that is the very nature of God and the very nature of what justice is meant to be. And I just want to tell you, there has been nothing like it anywhere else on earth, and there's almost nothing like it today. I tell you what, you go out there and you see all kinds of theories of justice and all kinds of ideologies about justice, and everybody's getting it wrong. Everybody's getting it wrong because they are missing out on this generous, loving, compassionate justice. That is what God is all about. Point number three, we are to be just like our just God. Hey, you know, every now and then we have a really impoverished view of salvation. We think, well, um, to, to be saved means I get my sins forgiven and I just wait till I go to heaven. And by the way, those are two very good things. And that is certainly part of salvation, getting your sins forgiven and, and having eternity with, with our wonderful God. But, but that's actually an impoverished view because it's so much more. I mean, forgiveness is just the start. And then you discover there's freedom from all that is wrong. You discover that there's healing for all that is broken. And even more, that there's transformation. You are like literally being renewed in the image of God. And we see that all throughout the Bible. I mean, God is a God of love, and we're told, well, love others. Well, how can we love others? Well, because the God of love lives in you through Jesus Christ, who is love. God is light. Let your light shine. How can I do that? Well, because Christ, who is the light of the world, is living in you. God is holy. Be holy. How is that possible? Because Christ, the Holy One of God, is inside of you. Do you see that? You see that? Like who God is is what Jesus was, and Jesus is all of that. In us, we are becoming like God in those moral virtues. And the same is true for justice. God is a just God. Therefore, be just. Do justice. Do what is right. It is all throughout the book of Deuteronomy. I'm just going to give you one example because this one example winds up giving us another absolutely distinct, unique feature of biblical justice that the world knows nothing about. In Deuteronomy 24, four times in the space of six verses, we read that God tells his people to do justice and be compassionate for a particular group of people. They are the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows. Four times, in six verses, that phrase is used. Do you think God's trying to tell his people something? Like, just in case you miss it, I'm going to tell you again. Oh, you might have missed it, I'm going to tell you again. And in case you missed it first two times, let me tell you one more time. Now, what's going on? Well, let me just tell you, God, God, God knows that there are some people that they are, they are in more danger of missing out on justice and compassion than other people. I mean, he, he wants justice and compassion for everybody, but be especially attentive to those folks who are very likely going to miss out unless we take time and energy to make sure they get justice and compassion. That's in chapter 24. And then in chapter 27, just three chapters later, comes a warning. My people, cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the who? Foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. Curse it if you withhold justice. And let all the people say, amen. You know, every now and then, we, and everybody said, amen. Curse it if you withhold justice from these people who are in most danger of missing it. And everybody said, amen. wow, you know what we just said? Okay, here, here's, here's the distinction. I, I sat down and thought of some groups of people who were in danger of missing out on justice and compassion. So here are those groups of people. Uh, the unborn need justice. Minority groups need justice. Sexual abuse victims need justice. The handicapped need justice. Immigrants need justice. Veterans need justice. Refugees need justice. The elderly need justice. The poor need justice. The victims of sex trafficking, they need justice. And innocent citizens who are living in war zones, they need justice too. Okay, now, here's what I know about my heart, and I'm pretty sure about your heart. 
we were saying yes and amen to some of those groups, but not to others, right? See, there are some of those groups that we were especially connected to because they're our people and they're our values. And there are some other groups, well, maybe not our people. And, and so here's our problem. We are all selective and biased when it comes to justice. Except God isn't. God is not selective or biased. God's plan for justice is justice for everyone, everywhere, all the time. And that is one of the things that makes biblical justice unique. Everywhere, for everyone, all the time. The Democrats don't have that. The Republicans don't have that. The white nationalists don't have that. The Black Lives Movement doesn't have that. Nobody has justice everywhere for everyone all the time except God and God's people. <laughs> or we should. And yet that's the, that's the opportunity. That's the mission. That's the commission that God is giving us. He wants to bless everybody. And the church should be this radically wonderful, different group with a biblical justice that just is better than anything else out there. And so therefore, that leads to point number four. Man, we got to accept responsibility for this stuff. Accept responsibility. Martin Luther King Jr. made, um, made a statement very famous. Now, he did not come up with it, and he actually changed it a little bit. It's been around for a number of people. But he basically said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Now, in some ways, that's very, very encouraging. Oh, yeah, justice is important. It's going to take a while, but there's something good news. It's kind of bending that way. Now, he was partially right. Because God has designed his, his moral, God's designed his universe with, more, with morality. I mean, that's something we believe as Christians. There, there's, something, there's something real and true about God's moral nature, and he's wired it into the universe. But, but here's what that quote left off. Not only, not only is this a moral universe, but it's a fallen world. It's a broken world. It's a sinful world. We made it that way. And so therefore, it should bend in that direction, but it doesn't. You know, the world, the world does not bend toward justice a, a lot. The world does not bend toward goodness. The world does not bend toward fairness. The world does, the world does not bend toward flourishing. I mean, we all know that. And so here's what God does. This, this is the third distinct thing. God bends the world that way. God bends the world that way by bending his people that way. And as God's people are being bent in that direction, then we are able to be used by God on this mission that we have to see justice and righteousness and loving kindness fled everywhere and the world flourishes. That's our calling and that's our challenge. And right now, it's more crucial than ever because there's a lot of pain out there. There are a lot of groups that are in a lot of pain because there's a lot of unfairness and there's a lot of injustice. There's so much pain. Listen, if I could do something very different, every now, every now and then I think, so what would I do different? Here's one thing I would do different. If I could go back many, many years, start much earlier, be much more consistent, I would, I would pay much more attention to the pains of people. I would pay much more attention to people's pain. Everybody has pain. Everybody sitting here has pain. And the pain that we see sometimes is just the tip of the iceberg for this far, far, far vaster, bigger pain that's deep down inside them. Everybody has pain. And some of the pains of unfairness and injustice are the, are the, are the worst that you can imagine. And when that pain is not understood, when that pain is not cared for, it leads to anger and it leads to violence. Isn't that what's happening out there? I mean, it's just everywhere. Listen, I know you guys have pain, and you want somebody to listen to your story, and you want somebody to enter into your story and understand, and even if they can't do something about it, they, they at least will, do you care? And if you say, yes, I really care, that alone means something. Sometimes that's all we can do is we can care, and we can enter, enter in. And I think right now that's part of the mission that God has for his church right here, right now, in this time in our social, cultural setting. We have to pay attention to the pain of the world. And move in, not with judgment, not with anger, not with dismissal. Because that's not generous justice. That's the way the world does justice. That's not the way God does it. Are you tracking with me on this? All right. Here's the problem. 
<laughs> You've heard us tell you this almost every week. God has this beautiful new plan for a beautiful new people doing life in a beautifully new way. And they messed it up. They failed. And in particular, their leaders failed. Man, it's like catastrophic failure on the part of the leaders. Flawed, failed leadership when it came to justice, righteousness, and loving kindness. In fact, as you read through the prophets over and over, and in fact, you'll, you'll read some of that this week if you pick up one of the devotionals. Um, they failed. And, and the prophets give God's words of reproach to these leaders who have failed so miserably. But there's something else the prophets have. The prophets also have a word from God that God's not done. God will never be done his mission for justice, righteousness, and loving kindness on earth. And so what God is going to do is God is going to raise up a new leader. In Ezekiel chapter 34, God spends about the first half of the chapter just, just, just rebuking the sins of, of, of leadership failure. But then he spends the rest of the chapter saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to do something different. And it's like there's 24 times when God says, I will, I will, I will, I will. Or here's just a couple of things God says he will do. I will establish justice. The leaders did. I will. I will save my people. The leaders were supposed to, but they didn't. I will. And I will raise up the right kind of shepherd that my leaders are supposed to be. I'm going to raise up the right kind of shepherd. And that shepherd is going to be like in this line of David. And of course, David has been done for, for long years and looking to the future. There's somebody coming our way. Who is it? One well, the prophet Isaiah. We read God gives more clarity. Man, the, 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 the governance of the world is going to be upon his shoulders. He's going to have the, the weight of the kingdom of God, and of that he will, he will bring justice and righteousness to earth, and we know he is talking about Jesus Christ. See, we're going to celebrate communion. Communion is where the generous justice, the compassionate righteousness, and the loving kindness of God came together, converged, and this one called Jesus, who went to the cross and died because we're not just and we're not righteous and we're not very loving. And so he died to make us just, to make us right, and to make us loving. And that's what we celebrate. That's, that's what we remember. And that's what we recommit ourselves to. It is like the core of our faith. Chris is going to lead us in a, 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 a collective reading of confession. And then Jay is going to come and, and lead us into to a, a time of communion. Let's prepare our hearts. We're going to read some words together from God's word and allow this to work on your hearts as we collectively confess the ways we have not lived up to God's standard of justice. So I'm going to begin us with a word from the Lord and then you as the people will respond by reading along with what's on the screen. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. O oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Amen. As we come to the table to remember that Jesus has what Jesus has done, let's do it in light of the things that we've just heard. You heard Brian say it a minute ago, but I think it's worth repeating this idea. At the cross, justice, righteousness, and the loving kindness of God come together for the salvation of the world. 
We're going to get to celebrate that more fully in a couple weeks as Good Friday and Easter draw near. But this morning, as we remember Jesus in the upper room with the disciples, he was standing ready to bend justice and in this moment invites us to do the same by remembering him. So as we go into this time of communion, if you've put your faith in Jesus, we're all about to receive the same bread, to drink from the same cup, to remember we are recipients of the same mercy and unmerited grace that Jesus (laughs) bent justice for us to receive. If you want to peel back the top layer to get the bread. Listen to these words of Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we take the bread, remember that justice requires sacrifice. One he freely made for all of us. Let's eat. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember the promise of Jesus' sacrifice. The holy blood that was spilled has bent justice and the forgiveness of sins is the righteousness offered to us. In this is the promise that all things will be made new. Let's drink and take part in it together. Father, we come before you right now and thank you for the work of Jesus. This passage starts by saying, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, that makes us all probably all think about the type of justice that should have happened in that moment. But instead... God chose to show us something different. He chose to enact his own justice, the one that only he can show, the way to make things right. Instead of taking revenge in a moment for betrayal, he walked to his death and invites us to take up a cross ourselves and follow him, to love our enemies instead of asking for retribution against them. God, the lessons that we have to learn are hard. It is so easy to see the other side of it and to cast blame and let our anger win. Thank you so much that Jesus' righteousness paves the way for that not to happen. Soften our own hearts in these moments, God, and may we become more like you, more just, more righteous, and to give a loving kindness to the world that it so desperately needs. Pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Hey there. Thanks for watching Living Word Community Church's YouTube channel. You can click to watch our most recent message and hit the subscribe button so you never miss a video or a live stream. We look forward to seeing you soon.